Thank you all for coming. I'm really pleased to welcome you all to uh, Vision and Neil Fulbert Gallery. I am, as you might guess, either Vision or Neil Fulbert, so I guess I'm Neil Fulbert. And uh, uh, I have, it's really a great pleasure for us here to have, uh, uh, to have uh, William Bill Myers and his wife, Nama, and Hama, as we've taken to calling her, uh, here. They've been our guests in, uh, uh, up north. They were in Rosh Pina with us for the weekend. And um, I could say that I met, uh, uh, I met Bill in his professional capacity, not exactly straight on. It's over a period of time. But uh, I have to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he comes from a background. He was in business and around 1998, is that correct? Somewhere uh, around. Right? Yeah, he did. He did a he did a course in uh, photography at the International Center of Photography in New York, and uh, uh, it completely changed his uh, uh, his life because he got totally absorbed in photography. I have to tell you that he has a tremendous background. He's very literate. He's very well educated. He has he has he has a he has a deep background that he calls upon for everything uh, that he does. So he's been doing photographs, which have been exhibited at, uh, let's see, I've got it here. They've been, they're in the principal and collection of the New York Public Library, the Museum of the City of New York, and, uh, and he's had exhibitions most recently at Nellie and Alexand Alexander Gallery, which is one of the best galleries in New York City. I know the gallery. And he's had exhibitions at, uh, at the Museum of the City of New York and uh, other places. And he's been writing. Uh, uh, the way he got into writing, and I asked him this question, how did you start writing? Uh, he probably was writing before. But uh, I said, why did you start writing? He was doing art reviews and, and articles on art. And uh, I said, how did you start that? He said, well, he said that, you know, I was out of business and I needed to make some money, so I went into writing. So, uh, <laughs> I find that amazing, you know, like, uh, I think that's astonishing that somebody can do that. Well, I didn't need to make a lot of money. <laughs> so, so, but he's been writing now for a long time, and he's really uh, respected in uh, New York and in the art world. He's written for Art News, uh, the New York Times, uh, uh, the Jewish uh, the forward. Uh, let's see, I'm just pulling out a few of these things. And I met him, uh, the Jewish Review of Books. Uh, I met him because uh, there was, for a little brief while, there was a tremendous newspaper in uh, New York City, the New York Sun, which was a revival of an older paper. And uh, they had a lot of art coverage. It was incredible. Uh, and uh, there's nothing like it now. I doubt that there'll ever be anything like it again. And he wrote these long, long, long pieces. And uh, I had the surprising honor uh, when I had an exhibition in, uh, in New York at a gallery there, at uh, Sloman House Gallery, to have him write a review of uh, my Impressionist work. I did a series of photographs uh, based on the work of the French Impressionists and, uh, and their history. And uh, he reviewed that. I got a nice long article with pictures and things like that. And uh, I thought, wow, God, I made it to the big time. This is it, you know, like, this is amazing. And the article was not, not your usual review. It was, it, was, it was incisive, it was deep, it was analytical. His style, he doesn't say a bad word about anybody, he just <coughs> describes things very, very nicely and deeply mm. and puts them in context. <laughs> and that's the way he writes. Now he's writing. You mean it was a good review. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, translated into authorese, yes, that means it's a good review. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and then I wrote him the notes, you know, and, but I never met him. And, uh, and then uh, since then, the New York Sun folded, and uh, he's been writing for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, about photography. Now they're cutting back a little bit too, but he was covering shows in New York, uh, like uh, in gallery shows and museum shows, like nobody else does. I mean, it's just incredible. So, uh, so I've been, the, I've had the privilege of having uh, 
uh, reviews of my work in the Wall Street Journal. And now, uh, in a, I told you he's a photographer. In, uh, in addition to, he's done several projects. Uh, this is his most recent, I think it's the most recent, or it's the most recently published. Most recently published. It's the most recently published. It's Outer Boroughs. Uh, it's uh, photographs uh, from New York. The parts that people very often don't see or don't write about or don't photograph. He said he went into a bookstore and uh, was looking for material about New York and everything was Manhattan. And he said, that's not all of New York. It's just a small part of New York. You wouldn't have trouble convincing me of that. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen too much of this. But, uh, but he, did this, he did this book on the other parts of New York, the outer boroughs. Mm. It, they're very elegant, very deep uh, uh, photographs. They're beautifully printed, beautifully seen. Uh, they, work, uh, they, they, they work by bringing together all sorts of different elements and unifying them in usually one very striking composition. I'm not a critic, so if I'm not uh, uh, speaking, I, I need that chair for myself, but there are other chairs. You could come sit here if you like. Okay. Hamatal, uh, come sit over here. So, uh, so that's by way of introducing uh, uh, Bill and uh, Nakama Meyer. Um, thank you. Uh, well, I, I think I ought to quit while I'm ahead. But um, anyway, I congratulate all of you on, on running the blockade and, and, and getting here. Uh, we're going to talk this evening uh, about the relationship between photography and Jews and Jews and photography. And, and I say we because uh, it's an informal setting. And if you know something I don't know and want to raise your hand uh, and uh, pipe up, uh, that's fine. If you have a question, uh, don't be bashful. Uh, I'm going to begin by telling you how I, I happen to get interested in um, pursuing this, this subject. Uh, it, was, it was a series of, of three seemingly unrelated incidents. Uh, my wife had uh, gotten me a membership in the International Center of Photography, ICP, uh, one of the major photographic institutions uh, in the country and probably the, the major one in New York City. And uh, early on, the, the, I'm talking about sometime in the mid-90s, uh, they used to send every year uh, a glossy annual report on what they'd been doing and uh, their shows and so forth. Uh, and I uh, was looking through it one year, and in the back they had the lists of all their major donors and of their board of trustees. I was looking over the, the list of, of people who were on the board of trustees, and I thought, gee, it's Jackie Kennedy Onassis and 20 Jews. <laughs> uh, uh, sometime after that, I, I was in uh, uh, Howard Greenberg's gallery when he was still down on uh, Worcester Street in Soho. Uh, and, and Howard is a, an enormously successful, knowledgeable uh, photography dealer. And he had a space in the back, uh, and on a table there was a little placard that he had sent up that said the Howard Greenberg Gallery represents these following uh, member, uh, people who had been members of the Photo League. The Photo League was uh, a, an institution that existed uh, from the late 30s to the mid 50s. Uh, that's a whole long story. But it was very important in the history of photography in New York. And when I went down the list of the uh, members of the uh, Photo League, and I said, gee, they're all Jews. When ICP was originally founded, the acronym ICP did not stand for International Center of Photography. It stood for the Institute for Concerned Photographers. <coughs> and uh, shortly after the, they did that, this was sometime I think in the 70s, they published a book called The Concerned Photographer. I had a copy of the book. And I was going through it again one day. And when my eye ran over the list of the uh, half dozen or so Photographers who were listed in the book, it was uh, Cornell Kappa, Robert Kappa, 
uh, Werner Bischoff, Dan Friedman, uh, Dan um, Wiener, rather, uh, Leonard, Lenny Friedman, uh, David Seymour, Andre Kurtz. I thought, gee, they're all Jews. So it dawned on me that there must be some connection between uh, photography and Jews. And when I started uh, looking into it, I, I saw that it, it was really impossible to study uh, American photography in the 20th century without acknowledging the contribution uh, made by Jews. As I said in, a, in an article I subsequently wrote for uh, Commentary Magazine, the, the role of Jews in photography in 20th century America is comparable to the role of uh, American blacks in the history of jazz uh, in that period. I mean, you couldn't imagine jazz without uh, all the great black uh, musicians. You can't imagine 20th century American photography without acknowledging the uh, great Jewish photographers. To, to make uh, something of a point of this, I'm, I'm going to discuss uh, briefly this book. Uh, the, New York's, uh, the New York School Photographs, 1936-1963, uh, by Jane Livingston. This is, this is uh, a classic, uh, one of the classic books on uh, the history of American photography and deals with a group of photographers who were all active in New York uh, during, this, uh, during this time period. It's a, it's a standard work. Uh, Neil, can, can you take me to the next uh, picture? In the book, uh, Livingston discusses 16 photographers. Of the 16 photographers, 13 of them are Jewish. Of the three who aren't Jewish, uh, Alexei Brodovich uh, only produced one small book of photographs. He's really remembered and is considered important because he was a mentor and teacher to a whole slew of great photographers, including many of the other people on the list. And for many years, he was the photo editor at uh, Hopper's Bazaar, a, a position which uh, uh, gave him the ability to uh, f give jobs to photographers. I mean, uh, especially in this period when these people were young photographers, the ability to take uh, photographs for Hopper's Bazaar paid a lot of the rent. Uh, and the other two non-Jews, David Vestal and Don uh, Donaghy, uh, Donaghy left photography early on and went out west to be a hippie. Vestal continued with his career in photography, but uh, after he left New York City, he never uh, developed into uh, a major photographer. But these other people, th these, are, these are major names. Lizette Modell, Robert Frank, William Klein, uh, Leon Levenstein, Bruce Davidson, Diane Arbus, Helen Levitt. Ouija, Saul Leiter, um, Richard Avedon. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few of them in, in, in a little bit of uh, detail, uh, but I'll, I'll read you a paragraph that I, I wrote trying to describe what Livingston had in mind when she said there was a New York school. She certainly didn't mean that these were guys who got together and had any kind of a formal relationship uh, with each other. She just meant they were people who happened to be active in New York at a certain time and whose work uh, shared certain characteristics. And um, among the characteristics, most of them, not all of them, uh, could be characterized by was a certain obsession with a gritty realism. Uh, this frequently meant that their pictures were blurred or grainy or slightly out of focus. Uh, the rules of formal composition were often violated, even flouted. There was something tough, occasionally brutal, uh, in their work. Uh, and although the pictures might sometimes be beautiful, they were never, never, never merely pretty. And in, in this way, we're talking about mid-20th century New York City, they, they had a lot in common with the no, uh, no, uh, noir movies, the uh, uh, very grim uh, movies that were 
uh, popular at that time with uh, jazz. Uh, that was uh, an important part of the cultural scene in New York at, at that period. And also with, with abstract expressionism, uh, which was blossoming uh, in, in New York uh, City at that time. And, and there were other photographers, and I'll mention some of them later on, some of whom were Jewish, many of whom were not, who were uh, in New York at this period. Uh, but, and maybe some of them should have been included in this group, but this is a, a pretty fair representation uh, of what was, what was going on at, at that period. Uh, let's see, who do I have up next, uh, Neil? Okay, this is, this is one of the, the most beloved of the photographers, certainly by anybody who lives in New York. This is Helen Levitt. Uh, Helen Levitt uh, was the epitome of a street photographer. Street photographers typically wandered the streets of New York and took candid photographs of the activity uh, on the streets. This came out of an ideology which, which thought of the, uh, the, the streets as an important locus of cultural, uh, social, and in some cases political uh, activity. But Levitt specialized in pictures of children. Uh, and the children are frequently doing, as kids on the city street will, uh, things that they really oughtn't, that are probably stupid. Uh, and so here are some boys uh, clowning around. Uh, they're frequently engaged in uh, aggressive acts, but never really brutal. I mean, I, I don't think these boys really intend to uh, do uh, much damage to each other. Uh, and, 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 and nobody that I'm aware of has ever been able to uh, uh, capture the, the children on the streets of the city the way that uh, Helen Levitt did. I mean, one of the reasons kids aren't photographed on the streets anymore is that they're all inside playing video games. But uh, OK, uh, next, please. Uh, no. Their parents might sue too. Yeah, <laughs> right. And, and nowadays, you have to be careful not to be sued if you photograph uh, a child uh, who, who doesn't want it. Okay, this is a for Leon Levenstein. Levenstein uh, was also a street photographer. He, he worked uh, doing layouts uh, for catalogs uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of Times Square. And on his lunch break, and when he had other uh, uh, available time, he would wander around the, the city uh, uh, in that midtown area uh, photographing people on the street. And also, he would go out to Coney Island, the, you know, the popular beach outside uh, Manhattan in, in, uh, in Brooklyn, uh, and f during the summer, and, and photograph people there. Levenstein's, uh, who, was a, who was a very strange and, and reclusive man in many ways, and a lot of his photograph, uh, photography is, is sort of body pots. I mean, this is the whole picture. They, 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 this hasn't been cropped. But somehow you, you have a sense of this human being just from seeing his, his back, the set of the body, the, the set of the shoulders, the fact that his bathing suit is down a little bit at, at, at the bottom. Uh, he was never really enormously uh, successful uh, during his life, but since that time uh, there's been an increased appreciation of his work. There was a major show of Levenstein's uh, photographs at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art about four or five years ago. And so now he is, he is really established in the Pantheon. Uh, Neil, do we have another? another Everybody knows who this is. Who is this? Ouija. It's Ouija. <laughs> okay. So Ouija, uh, as uh, I'm sure a lot of you know, was, was, was a great photojournalist of, of, of crime scenes, of, uh, of fires, of disasters, all sorts of human misery. Uh, the next picture, Neil. I mean, one of the things he, he, he photographed was pictures of dead gangsters. So here's, here's some thug that was gunned down on the streets of New York and, and lies here dead with his face in the gutter. Um, Ouija, uh, among other things, had the first radio telephone. And, uh, he was the first civilian ever to have a radio telephone in his car so he could tap into the police lines 
and know where, where, where a crime had been committed. And he frequently managed to get there before the police. Um, and he, he also had in the trunk of his car almost a complete uh, dock room and, and uh, equipment, all the flash bulbs that he needed to make his uh, th these pictures, which have so much light on them. There were this huge screw-in type uh, flash bulbs. Uh, and, and he established himself, his, his, the back of his pictures is stamped with his, uh, his stamp, which read, Ouija the Famous. He, he was not, <laughs> yeah, he, he, was, he, 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 he was not modest. Um, but uh, at, 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 at some point, uh, he got taken up, uh, uh, not just as a photojournalist, but as an artist. They published a, a wonderful book, The Naked City, which had uh, a lot of these photographs in it. He had uh, a show at the Museum of Modern Art, and it really sort of destroyed him because then he was no longer a photojournalist, but he was an artist, and he was really uh, a fish out of water at, at, at that point. Okay, the next. Uh, oh, this is another Ouija f photograph. I mean, he had a great sense of humor, and he, and he had uh, relationships with a lot of the floating population uh, of New York City at, in the, on the Bowery, the uh, Skid Row at that time. Uh, this is outside the Metropolitan Opera on opening night. These two women are society ladies on their way in. This uh, derelict woman, Ouija brought her here. <laughs> she, she, she didn't just happen to show up. We, we knew what would make a good picture, and, uh, and, and he, he brought it. This picture is called The Critic, and, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's one of his classics. All right, what, what do we have next, Neil? Um, this is another uh, one of the New York schools. This is William Klein. Uh, William Klein uh, grew up in the city. Uh, went to Paris uh, to study art, I think with Ferdinand Leger, and came back uh, to New York uh, in the mid-50s and found it rather changed. So he, he went around with, with a camera uh, photographing the work. And his work uh, very much exemplifies, almost to an extreme, the characteristics of, of the uh, New York school. They're very uh, contrasty, black and white. He, he frequently blew up just a small section of a negative uh, to use for his final print. So they tend to be very grainy and uh, um, very aggressively intrusive uh, into uh, the goings on of people. Uh, this somewhat vicious looking kid was also a setup. I mean, it's a toy gun uh, that nobody was going to get hurt. And uh, Klein sort of encouraged him to uh, uh, pose uh, like this. And the kid had probably been to enough uh, cops and robbers movies that he knew what a thug was supposed to look like. Uh, this kid looks like he thinks the other kid is a little bit ditzy, but, uh, but that's, that, that's, that's what makes the picture. And, and, and again, Klein, uh, who's now uh, quite elderly, uh, has uh, had his earlier work uh, be appreciated. He, uh, he published the, the New York pictures. The title of the book was Life is Good and Good for You in New York, colon, Trans Witness Reveals. Uh, and this was just recently uh, reviewed in connection with several uh, shows in New York of Klein's work and a very long uh, appreciation of him in, um, in the New York magazine. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll do one more, I guess. Uh, you know. Okay, this is uh, Robert, the cover of Robert Frank's book, uh, *The Americans*. This is probably the, the most important single book of photographs published in America in the second half uh, of the 20th century. The only one, uh, other one, uh, from the the century that, that is comparably uh, important and influential was Walker Evans. American Photographs, which was published uh, in the uh, 30s, uh, I, I believe. Uh, there was recently an enormous amount of hoopla uh, about the uh, 50th anniversary uh, of the publication 
of the Americans with uh, uh, the, the work that's in the book was shown uh, originally at, at the Museum of Modern Art. And for this uh, anniversary celebration a few years ago, uh, that show was recreated at the National Gallery in Washington and then moved to uh, Metropolitan Gallery in New York and, and went to several uh, other cities. Um, Neil, can, can you skip ahead? Do you, do you have all the pictures here? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Well, uh, this, okay. I, I got to go. I got to talk about uh, uh, Gary Winogrand. Gary Winogrand, who is not included in Livingston's book, but who was certainly a very active photographer during this time period, was again an archetypal street photographer. Uh, he, uh, he he just was evidently manic when he was on the street with uh, with uh, with his camera, and had a, had an ability to pick things out that in some way have to be. I mean, there's nothing extraordinary about this. Yet somehow it's a very compelling image. What is it? Well, it's these three guys. They all seem to be wearing what, uh, what looks like something uh, of a uniform. And so it becomes memorable. But what Winogrand really liked to photograph on the streets of New York, Q, was women. And, uh, and, and he published a whole book of, of women seen on the streets of New York. Uh, and because he traveled on the streets of Miami, on the streets of, of, of Los Angeles. And uh, here again, it's, it's, it's a very interesting study of when people walk along the street, you know, they're on, in one way they have to be aware of what's going on around them, but also they, they somehow manage to somewhat withdraw into themselves. And uh, Winogrand caught that. Uh, um, uh, next, and one of the uh, people who is in the uh, Livingston book is the great Robert Kappa, uh, who was, uh, among other things, uh, probably the, the the greatest combat photographer of the 20th century, uh, who established his reputation while photographing the Civil War in Spain in the 1930s was the only photographer to go ashore uh, with the uh, Allied troops on D-Day when they landed in, in Normandy. Uh, and, and this was uh, one of the memorable pictures of, of the horrible uh, experience they had uh, coming onto the beach and being under fire from the, uh, from the German uh, guns uh, above them. And while we're on the subject of, of war photographers, probably the most reproduced photograph of all times, uh, among other reasons, because it was once used uh, on a US postage stamp. And of course, and they published millions of the stamps. Uh, but uh, this is Joe Rosenthal's picture of the Marines planting the American flag on the top of Mount Suribachi uh, on Iwo Jima, one of the most violent and, and deadly uh, battles uh, of, of the, uh, in the Pacific during World War II, uh, one that cost uh, uh, many Americans their lives. And the Japanese, who weren't killed by the Americans, almost all of them, including the nurses and civilians, committed suicide. So it, it, was, a, it was a very deadly encounter. Interestingly enough, this picture was the inspiration for Evgeny Kaledi's uh, photograph uh, of planting the Soviet flag on top of the Reichstag in Germany. Kaledi, who was also a Jew, uh, was the most prominent Soviet war photographer. And when he saw this picture, he wanted to, to do, do something that was duplicated. So his picture shows Soviet photographers putting the uh, hammer and sickle flag on top of the Reichstag while Berlin down below is, is in flames. Uh, next. OK, but, but photographers took pictures besides uh, gritty street scenes and, and warfare. This is uh, one of Richard Avedon's 
most famous picture is a model named Davima. I don't know the names of the elephants, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, it, it shows his elegance. He, by the way, got uh, involved in fashion photography in the same way Diane Arbus, who started as a fashion photographer, did. Uh, bo for both the photographer, their parents uh, uh, were in the rag trade. They, they sold clothes. And so they, they grew up with some familiarity with fashion and, and with fashion photographs. And, and then began uh, careers very young. Uh, Abaddon was already a, a successful fashion photographer in, in his early 20s, but he wanted to establish a reputation beyond, beyond fashion. Uh, the, the first book that he produced beyond that was pictures of his father as his father was dying of cancer. He had had a very troubled relations with his father. Uh, and somehow, in the course of this book, which in a way is a very painful book, uh, because in the, in the course of the book, the, uh, the man is deteriorating, and by the end of the book, he, he dies. But Abaddon was somehow able to reconcile himself to his father uh, through this process of photographing him at this, uh, at this grim period. Uh, there were many other uh, very important American photographers during the period. Neil is going to flip through them. I'm not going to talk much about them. I'll just name who they are as, as their pictures come up. The, uh, but I've got to tell you that this is Irving Penn. Uh, well, it's not Irving Penn. It's Irving Penn's wife, Lisa Fonsegrave. Uh, but it's an example of his brilliant uh, fashion work. M many of the important fashion photographers were, were Jews. Abaddon, Penn, um, Milton Green, uh, I don't read the fashion magazines, but I know there are others. Uh, but Penn also moved well beyond fashion photography as his career developed. He was a great um, a photographer of uh, celebrities, personalities. But then also, and I think this was a, a very characteristic uh, uh, preoccupation for Jews, did a series called Small Trades. Small Trades is a term uh, that, that derives from the French of people who do uh, street sweepers, chimney sweeps, people who sell cheese, uh, people who run markets, tailors. So, uh, you know, the small people, the small businesses uh, who keep uh, civilization going, uh, who provide us with our daily needs. And he did this very sympathetic series of photographs of people in the small trades, some in America, some in London, some in, uh, in, in France. Uh, he also subsequently uh, did series of natives in Peru and in Africa, where he photographed them uh, as if they were fashion uh, models uh, or, or celebrities. And, and it gives these people great stature. It, it shows them not as uh, simply ethnographic uh, examples, but as uh, fully characterized human beings. Uh, OK, I'll try to be brief. Ezra Stola. Ezra Stola went to um, architecture school. And while he was uh, studying architecture, uh, started taking photographs of uh, the, some of his uh, contemporaries' projects. Uh, he never practiced architecture, but became the premier architectural photographer of mid-20th century. Uh, the famous architects of the period, and there were many, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, I.M. Pei, uh, the, 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 the people at... Um, I'm blocking on it. Uh, but they wouldn't consider their building done until he had taken the, the photographs of it. And they wouldn't allow other people. I mean, I mean it was said that, that he could find the soul of a building. Uh, he, and he, he was very meticulous. He took a lot of time. He would wait till the sun was exactly right. And he was a, a technically brilliant photographer. His, his pictures are so important in American uh, architectural history that 
his photographs have influenced the course uh, of American architecture, to say nothing of uh, architectural photography. Uh, next. Uh, this is another picture of Midtown Manhattan. This is by Alfred Stieglitz, who was born in the late 19th century and lived into uh, uh, the mid 20th century. Uh, the most important photographer in America in his heyday was himself a photographer, wrote voluminously about photography, published uh, a book that is still a model of what uh, a photographic uh, publication should be, camera work, uh, talked uh, incessantly, wouldn't shut up uh, if it was a good day, um, sometimes made sense. Uh, but he was, he was the arbiter of whose work was, was going to be successful and whose work wouldn't be successful during this uh, early period uh, of the uh, 20th century. He, uh, as, uh, as an important American photographer, was succeeded by Paul Strand. Uh, Paul Strand's uh, family name was originally Stransky. Uh, his father uh, anglicized it uh, to Strand. This is a famous picture he took early in his career of uh, people going to work on Wall Street. And you can see that they're dwarfed uh, in this canyon by this uh, enormous building, the windows of which are, are blank and, and don't allow us to see what's going on inside. He's also famous for this picture, which is a very important picture in the history of American photography. This is a, a, a blind woman who's, who is a beggar. Uh, it, it, as you can see, it's, 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 it's really almost cruel, almost uh, uh, brutal. But uh, again, it, it, it doesn't try to hide who this woman is or, or, or what her, her condition is. And many of the photographers of mid-century were very much influenced uh, by this one picture and felt that, that this picture gave them license to do the sort of work that they did, which again, was not necessarily polite and, and not uh, genteel. Uh, this is, uh, again, one of Livingston's photographers, uh, Bruce Davidson. Uh, this is a series he did uh, called Brooklyn Gangs. Uh, this was uh, taken in the uh, uh, 50s uh, when gangs you know, mostly hung around and uh, occasionally fought with each other. Uh, they were nothing like the gangs that were going to visit havoc on the city uh, a few decades later. Uh, but they were considered quite exotic. And, and, and Davidson, uh, who had established a name for himself, uh, or was to establish a name for himself after this, photographing the civil rights movement, uh, began his career with, with this project. Uh, and, and one of his later projects called East 110th Street, those of you who know New York, you know, East 110th Street is the middle of what's known as Spanish Harlem. So he spent an extended period, uh, well over a year, photographing just one block, the people on just one block uh, in Spanish Harlem. And again, he used a view camera and, and photographed them. Uh, these are not candids. I mean, the people are well aware they're being photographed. But his, his work uh, shows enormous respect. Uh, for them. This is Cindy Sherman, uh, who is still uh, very much, uh, alas, uh, on, on the scene. In her early career, began when she took these uh, pictures, which uh, make fun, in, in a way, of uh, the, the little black and white post pictures that used to get post, uh, put up in movie theaters. When you went into a movie theater, there would be these little black and white 8 by 10 uh, pictures of stills from the movie. And she did pictures that spoofed those pictures. Since then, she's done these pictures that um, I'm not happy about. Uh, OK. Now, in addition to being ex extremely important as photographers, Jews have also uh, been implicated in, in photography in America in, in many other ways. And one of the ways, not surprising uh, for Jews, is 
by writing about photography. Uh, Alan Trachtenberg, who, who we'll come back to later, is uh, a, a very well-known uh, professor from Yale University, professor of American studies. And what his, one of his main contributions to uh, uh, the study of American history was to use photography uh, as a source for understanding uh, what was going on in America at different scenes. So he begins with Matthew Brady. Matthew Brady was a, a mid uh, 19th century photographer who took pictures of almost all the important personalities of the day. Uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, credited uh, Matthew Brady with taking the picture that won him the election because it gave him uh, so much uh, stature. Uh, Brady also went on to uh, be one of the earliest uh, photographers to cover conflict. He brought a whole crew down to the areas that were involved in the American Civil War. Uh, he, they, they didn't have equipment in those days that would have allowed him to photograph combat as it was progressing, but they frequently showed up the next day to take pictures of, of fields with thousands, thousands of young men dead uh, on the field. And of course, this had an enormous impact uh, on the uh, American public uh, when these were, were subsequently shown. So that's a very important contribution that Trachtenberg read. Uh, Marina Hirsch, another one of the uh, writers who've used photography uh, as a basis for understanding other phenomena. Um, and here she, she talks about using photography to understand her own family, some of which had perished in the Holocaust, and her relationship to uh, that body uh, uh, of work. Uh, other uh, important Jewish writers, not necessarily Americans, on photography uh, were Walter Benjamin, the uh, German intellectual whose essay on the uh, mechanical reproduction uh, of art is considered one of the sort of ur texts uh, for understanding photography and its relationship to other arts. He talks about what does it mean that you can create a work of art, and it can be duplicated and duplicated and duplicated. Uh, Michelangelo can't duplicate the Sistine Chapel. There's only one of them. But uh, a photographer uh, can and frequently does make multiple copies of the same work. Uh, this is, Diane, this is uh, uh, the beginning of a paper by uh, Laura Levitt, who's uh, now, uh, I believe, the chairman of the Department of Judaic Studies at Temple University, and who also uses uh, photography as an important resource in her work in understanding Jews. Uh, this is uh, one of the books she's analyzed, Larry Sultan's a, a book about his parents. Uh, this is a picture of them in Florida. Uh, There's his father watching the baseball game. There's his mother wearing uh, a very What's the word for this outfit? <laughs> uh, okay, very, very. It's meant to be it's, it's maybe laughable. Yes, I mean this, this. This is not quite an appropriate outfit for a woman of this age uh, to be wearing. Uh, but you know, it's his mom and dad. And if you're a photographer, especially if you're a photographer in the last half of the 20th century, you tell it as it is. Uh, this is the, uh, it's a little bit out of sequence, is Doris Ullman, who was a, an early uh, 20th century photographer. Uh, next. Um, George Gilbert, uh, Gilbert is not his real name, uh, put together a, a book, uh, The Illustrated Worldwide Who's Who's of Jews in Photography. It's very interesting. He should have had a, a, a a fact checker because uh, um, mostly right, but, but, but not entirely right. But it was one of the first sources of, uh, of, a, of a compendium of the involvement of Jews in, in photography. Uh, what, what's my next picture now? OK, um, before, I, before I come to Bill Aaron and his very important 
uh, a contribution. I want to say there were other areas uh, that the Jews were involved in in photography. One of them was, was the retail uh, end of photographic equipment. Uh, all, almost all the major photography stores in New York City, Alkit, Willoughby's, Central, B&H, 47th Street Photo, uh, Autorama, uh, and, and there were still uh, uh, several more, were had Jewish owners. Uh, when I was growing up in Providence, Rhode Island, there was only one store that had serious ph photographic equipment. Where, I mean, where you go to buy uh, the chemicals you needed for a dark room and the paper uh, and uh, sophisticated cameras, and that was Adler Photo. Uh, what we've been talking about, uh, very famous photographers, name photographers, people who uh, are permanently part of the record of photography, but it's important to realize that behind them were thousands and thousands of other Jews who made their living as photographers, who, who weren't famous, who didn't think of themselves, well, maybe once in a while uh, when, when they were feeling their oats, but they didn't consider themselves artists, certainly not great artists, but they made their livings with a camera. They, uh, they had little studios in, in stores in, in cities all over uh, America. Um, and they were this, uh, where you would go, I mean, before everybody had an iPhone and could take uh, all the family pictures he wanted by himself. These were the guys you went to uh, for a christening, uh, when you wanted to take a picture of your child for a christening, or a baptism, or graduation from school, or, you, or wedding photographs, or a big party uh, to celebrate some occasion, or just you felt you, you needed to have uh, a family picture. The number of these sorts of photographers who were Jewish uh, is way out of proportion to their presence in the um, population. Now, one of the things, uh, back to a second, one of the things that's interesting about all these Jewish photographers in mid-century is that, by and large, they did not photograph Jews. They did not. They, they did not bring attention to themselves as Jews by photographing Jews. Uh, I, I can only think of one photographer of some reputation, um, Larry Engel, uh, who, who I once saw some pictures he took of a Seder. Uh, but he is, he's a third rank photographer. He isn't really a, a, one of these well known we people. Arnold Eagle. Uh, Arnold Eagle, I'm sorry. I, I always get Eagle and, and Engel mixed up. Yeah. Uh, uh, but he's the only one, am I right, in that period? I don't know, but they're very, they're very unusual. I can also say that, yeah. uh, you know, that I, I, I have a small collection that I acquired from his, uh, from his widow. And one oh. afternoon in, in New York, I went to visit him. And uh, I thought people would be interested. Nobody's interested. He had an exhibition. Yeah. They did an exhibition in the uh, late 60s of his uh, work at the uh, Shiba University Museum. And it was an aperture book, yeah. but uh, but I have the prints here. Nobody's ever exhibited the slightest interest in them, right. and they're beautifully done. He was yeah. a filmmaker, yeah. so he used all the techniques of uh. lighting and film uh. that that he had used to make these films to make these still photographs. Uh. They were really quite lovely, okay. but nobody's interested. In them. Well, so that's that's an interesting phenomenon. I can't explain it. Well, I can't explain it. I, well, I could think of some possible reasons. You'd have to have been able to ask each one of these people individually why they made the choices they did. But Bill Aaron uh, really started something when he published this book from the corners uh, of the earth. Uh, and you see the contemporary photographs of the Jewish world. Bill Aaron is, is a very successful West Coast photographer. Uh, but very involved in, in uh, Jewish uh, uh, affairs and, and, and I, I think learned uh, as, as a Jew. Uh, and he created a, a series of, of very dramatic images. So this, this man uh, out in, in uh, some rural area in a, a park or a forest uh, covered with a talit, wandering alone, presumably if he's wearing his talit, he's either davening or at least he's He's thinking of, of some, uh, something with, with a spiritual content. Um, is, is, is uh, I think, beloved of, of many, many people. 
Um, another, uh, another photographer who, uh, who, who followed uh, in, in his uh, footsteps, uh, taking a smaller segment of the Jewish community, was uh, Lori Grinker. Lori Grinker was a, a combat photographer. Uh, but she got interested, in, I guess, in her own Jewishness and, and began a series of pictures of Jewish women. She calls it the invisible thread. Uh, and she's traveled all around the country taking pictures of Jewish women in many different circumstances. Uh, here's a woman who looks like she's uh, uh, drafting a ketubah. Uh, here are two, uh, obviously, elderly women. Here are some sisters. This is Susie uh, Heschel, uh, daughter of uh, the famous uh, um, Abraham Joshua Heschel, and now uh, uh, a teacher of uh, Jewish studies. Um, I, I think I've got some of the pictures from Laurie's book. Here's, here's one of some women involved in, in reading from the Torah. And the next one, uh, a, a sort of domestic scene that I think probably a lot of people here can uh, relate to of, of a mother uh, helping her kids with, with their meal. It must, it must be one of the holidays they're, they're wearing uh, little crowns. Uh, okay, and then uh, our, 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 our friend uh, Penny Wolin did a book called uh, Jews uh, of Wyoming Fringe of uh, the Asper. Uh, Penny grew up in Colorado, and Wyoming, like Colorado, is an enormous space in, in the western part of the United States uh, where Jews are very few and far behind, between. And so for those Jews who want to maintain uh, a Jewish life, a, a connection with their Judaism, uh, it's difficult. It's difficult. I mean, you, you don't just go around the corner and, and find a minion. I mean, the corner may be 10 miles away. Uh, so this was a, a body of work uh, that was exhibited at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington and that uh, also became uh, a book. Um, Next, Neil, please. Uh, this is one of the pictures of uh, one of these Western uh, Jewish women. Uh, next. OK, now, now, Penny, there was a show in New York uh, about 10 years ago, I guess it is now, uh, called New York's Capital of Photography, which was curated uh, by Max Kozloff. Kozloff uh, is a photographer a teacher, a curator, uh, and, and a writer, and, and, and a critic. He put together a, a, a fairly extensive exhibition at the Jewish Museum of photographs that he thought w were important to understanding the history of New York City in the 20th century. Uh, but as he said, as in the catalog uh, that, that uh, came out of the show, um, about 85% of the pictures were taken by Jews. Uh, there's, there's, there was just no way uh, around it. Uh, and in, in reviewing the show, uh, my colleague at the Wall Street Journal, Richard Woodward, who I believe is not Jewish, uh, mentioned that, gee, it would be interesting for somebody to find out why did so many Jews become photographers? Penny sort of took up that, uh, that's OK. That, uh, took up that challenge. And she decided the best way to find out why so many Jews became photographers is to go and ask them. Um, so she spent many years uh, traveling around the United States in, in her van, uh, talking to photographers, at least those who would talk to her. And in the cases of photographers who were no longer uh, living, she, uh, she would talk to their family if, uh, if they felt they had some insights that could uh, be helpful. And for each photographer, she developed a, an interesting protocol. She had one photograph that they said had influenced them early on in their life to become a photographer. In many cases, these were pictures of their parents or grandparents, particularly if they had been immigrants. And the pictures showed them looking somewhat exotic uh, as they would have seemed to uh, American youngsters. Uh, and, and then she, she had uh, pictures uh, of the photographers and then a picture by uh, the photographers. 
So it's a very informative book. It's, 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 as you can see, it's a, a list of very important. Herb Ritz, another one of the great uh, fashion photographers. Walter Rosenblum was the most decorated combat photographer in World War II. Uh, here's our friend Gary Winogrand, Joe Peter Whitcomb, a very perverse uh, photographer. Philip Hallsman, immigrant from France, uh, took more Life magazine photographs than any other uh, photographer, over a hundred. Um, uh, who else do we, do we have here? Sid Kaplan, still around as a great uh, a, a photographer and, and a, a printer. Annie Leibovitz, uh, very well known now for her uh, pictures of uh, celebrities. Uh, Eleanor uh, Carucci, who uh, is actually an Israeli and whom I ran into last week uh, at the School of Visual Arts. Um, it's interesting, or, or I think somewhat exasperating, to try to speculate on why this is so. I mean, you could not put together a comparable <coughs> list of famous American, Italian-American photographers, or Irish-American photographers, or, or even Gentile photographers. I mean, Gentile photographers, you had Walker Evans. I mean, he's you know, one, of the, one of the gods. But there's not a whole bunch of him. Um, so what did this? I've got a few suggestions. You, you're, you're welcome to uh, shout me down if you want. One of the things, uh, Michael Berkowitz, who teaches in the Jewish uh, Judaic Studies Department, and I think it's King's College in London, recently published a book uh, about the involvement of Jews in British photography. There were no great Jewish photographers in Britain. But then again, there were no really great British photographers in Britain in the 20th century, with the possible exception of Bill Brandt. Um, Berkowitz uh, got interested in, in this subject because he had a, a, an uncle or a grandfather who had been, while still in, in Eastern Europe, a photographer. And it had also come to Berkowitz's attention that so many uh, of the photographers in, in Central and Eastern Europe were, uh, were Jewish. Uh, Lucien Dobrzynski, who's one of the great historians of uh, Central European uh, Jewish history, 20th century, once told me, if you had your picture taken, if you had a photograph, a portrait, a formal portrait of yourself taken anywhere in Central or Eastern Europe, uh, until Hitler eliminated the Jews, the chances were overwhelming that your photograph was taken by a Jew. The Tsar had his picture taken by a Jew. The Nazi officers, before the, the uh, work, the, the, the roundup of Jews began, would go in their uniforms to a Jewish photographer to have their picture taken. One of the things Berkowitz suggests for the incredible involvement of Jews in photography, it's a lousy job. Early on, this was not something people wanted to do. I mean, we're talking about beginning in the early days of photography, the late 18th, or the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, when Jews were, were getting heavily involved in uh, photography as, as uh, doing all this portrait work. First of all, you, you dealt with chemicals. They smelled bad. They were dangerous. They were toxic. You really had to be careful and know what you were doing with these chemicals. People didn't want to get around. And then you worked with these chemicals in the dark. You couldn't see what you were doing. You were in a room with maybe a little light on. This was scary. Uh, if you were a portrait photographer, you had to touch people and get them set up. It wasn't something that a lot of people wanted to do. Uh, that was the downside. The upside of it was uh, it didn't cost a lot of money to, to get involved in this. Uh, I mean, you had to go out and buy a camera, and that uh, a good camera would cost something. But it wasn't like buying a factory. Uh, you, you could buy a camera. You could uh, use a, 
a, a closet uh, or your ba a bathroom in a house uh, as a dark room uh, to do your, your developing. And you could go in business. And, and you'd be your own boss. Uh, and, and so that was uh, an inducement uh, to come in. Another one of the things that I think has drawn Jews, and, and here I would say I'm talking more about the Jews who came, became involved in photography with the notion of becoming artists, who conceived of themselves as artists. The arts that Jews got involved in in the 20th century were frequently on the technological edge. Uh, the early days of radio, the early days of television, the early days of music recording, the early uh, record companies. General Sarnoff. General Sarnoff, exactly. And, and what's his ditch? Uh, William Paley. Uh, and so all the movie moguls who, who ran the studios in, in the great heyday uh, of, of Washington, uh, of, uh, of Hollywood, rather. And, and one of the things that these arts uh, have in common is they, they reach a mass audience. It isn't, you know, a painter paints a painting and you know, somebody buys it and it's in that person's house. Maybe, maybe it, it ends up in a, a museum. Not likely. But if you make a movie and it's at all good, it's going to be seen by thousands of people. And similarly, these photographers, I think, hoped that their work, which was published in the magazines, and, uh, uh, and newspapers of the day, it was going to reach thousands of people, thousands at one time. And it's possible that they thought they could have some sort of social impact. Not all of them. Uh, some of them, yes. Uh, uh, Leonard Freed uh, and, and Bruce Davidson, when they went south and put themselves in jeopardy photographing the civil rights marches, uh, certainly thought that they were doing something of social utility, that they were bringing back pictures of the way in which uh, the blacks were being brutalized uh, and in the hope that it would help uh, end the uh, segregation that, that was still in force. Uh, but not all of them. Uh, Stieglitz, uh, if he had a social notion in his mind, I, I haven't discovered it, uh, he, was, he was an aesthete. Uh, and many, uh, and some of the others were aesthetes, but but large numbers of them were very involved in in the uh, social uh, practice of photography. The Photo League, the, the famous Photo League from mid-century uh, in New York, was devoted to uh, uh, social causes. Uh, it, it ended up in 1957 being put on. Uh, the Attorney General's list of subversive activities, which closed it down. It was a very stupid ruling on the part of uh, uh, the Attorney General. Uh, but there was no question that, that, that they saw photography uh, as an instrument uh, of uh, social change. Uh, but I would like to go one step further. Do I have anything else on, on, on here? Uh, Oh, oh, let me let me take you back a, a, a step. Uh, this is a, a list that Penny developed of people who are dead, and so obviously could not be uh, were not available for her to interview. But here again, this is a, a quite extensive list of many uh, very uh, significant uh, American uh, photographers uh, from the period we're, we're talking about. This is her list of uh, Jewish photographers who wouldn't talk to her, <laughs> who, who, who were alive. Uh, but in some cases, they, these, are, these are people who didn't identify as Jews. And, and maybe, uh, although they had Jewish names, it was because their father was Jewish. They didn't grow up in a Jewish household. At any rate, they didn't want to talk to Penny. Um, that's their right. Uh, here, uh, to get back to Alan Trachtenberg. He wrote what's probably the best single article uh, about the involvement of Jews in uh, photography. This was published in the Packentrager, which is uh, a publication of the uh, Yiddish National Book Center in uh, 
in Massachusetts. Uh, the, he talks about the Jewish eye. There was a, a notion of the Jewish eye. It was thought that this was a, a phrase not necessarily used by people who were uh, uh, favorably inclined to Jews. The Jews had the ability to look at something, and they could tell you what it was worth. That was why they were such good businessmen. They knew the, they had a Jew eye. They had a Jewish eye. They, they could look at something that other people thought was a, a derelict uh, piece of uh, trash. But, but they knew somehow that it was valuable, and they would be able to uh, obtain it and, and somehow help themselves get rich. Uh, and, and also that, that they had some supernatural, almost, ability to see into things. Um, so he examines uh, that and, and then also gets on to, to talk about, again, the fact that there were so many Jews uh, involved in photography and, and to speculate on uh, other reasons why. I, I would, in uh, more or less concluding this, like, like to bring up uh, two other uh, possibilities, somewhat uh, related, if you'll bear with me. Uh, oh, and needless to say, the, the, the people who wrote most about photography as critics uh, for the daily newspapers and for magazines were also Jewish. A.D. Coleman, uh, the, the great Vicki Goldberg, uh, several others. Blah, 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 blah. Um, anyway, one of the people who I, 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 I cited once in a, in a colloquy I organized to discuss um, uh, Jews in photography uh, was Abraham Joshua Heschel, Rabbi Heschel. Uh, in, in his book uh, on the Sabbath, he, he talks about the importance of, of time, the notion of time uh, for Jews. He describes the, the Sabbath, uh, Shabbos, as a cathedral in time. He said Gentiles built physical cathedrals, cathedrals that had uh, a, a spatial dimension. But the Jews created the equivalent of a cathedral in time by sacralizing time, time itself. Now, many of the arts are involved in time. For instance, dances need timing. A, a play takes place in time or, or, or a movie. Music, musicians have to have a sense of time to all stay uh, together. But photography arrests time. Photography stops time. We talk about a photograph uh, not just as fixing a moment, uh, not just as fixing a place or an event, but we say that the photography has fixed a moment. It somehow made a slice of time permanent. Uh, also experience engages quite different like when you experience music, so it has a certain duration for a movie or yeah. even when you read a book, yeah. it has a beginning and an end for passage. But this, like, nobody tells you how long to stare into this world, exactly what you mm -hmm. see. Right, it's exactly so. You can make that moment when you're uh, the viewer can make that moment last as long as he wants. You can't tell the movie projector to stop. Uh, I want to see that, that scene again. That's that's very good. Um, so, so there's this notion. Uh, of the involvement of Jews in time. And of course, one of the reasons they're involved uh, in time is because uh, we're, we're being enjoined again and again uh, in the Torah and in the other writings to remember, to remember. We, we have to uh, be able to fix things, our experience, and we have to remember things that, that, that happened before our, our coming happened. And one of the ways we can do that is by looking at photographs, studying the photographs uh, of that people have taken uh, before us, and, and we can fix as memories for ourselves uh, things that uh, we, we photograph. And I, I'd, I'd like to uh, conclude by quoting uh, from uh, Aviva Zornberg, the, uh, the great contemporary 
uh, biblical exegete. In, in her book, The Particulars of Rapture, Reflections on Exodus. Now, Neil, who knows something too, uh, in, in, in a lecture he gave uh, about photography, talks about uh, the section of, of, in the Torah about the building of the Mishkan, the uh, tabernacle that the Jews built in the wilderness. And, for, uh, and artists of all types have always taken the story surrounding the building of the Mishkan as paradigms uh, for their own uh, artistry. Zornberg talks about the building of the Mishkan, but she also talks about that other creative art that the Jews engaged at, uh, uh, just as they were getting the instructions to build the Mishkan. And that's the building of the, or the creation anyway, of the golden calf, the, uh, uh, for which they were sorely uh, admonished and came close to uh, being, uh, being wiped out. But, but to Zornberg, both of these events have a similar uh, psychological uh, reason uh, in, in the people who are involved in them. And she suggests that what it is at heart is, quote, a sustained concern with time and memory, a fascination with both the timeless moment of full presence and the subtle gifts of temporality and process a sustained concern with time and memory, a fascination with both the timeless moment of full presence and the subtle gifts of temporality and process. I would like to suggest to you that her uh, expression, the timeless moment of full presence, is what photographers, Jewish photographers, are attempting when they are working to the best of their ability. Thank you. Thank you.